What is naive set theory? Naive set theory is an informal set theory. It's a bridge for students to have access to sets without having to define what a set is rigorously. That means that by the end of this video, you will learn about as much as you can about sets without actually rigorously defining them. But wait, why not just define sets rigorously? Why should we define sets at all without actually defining sets properly? Well, properly defining sets rigorously does not benefit students much more than if those students learn sets from naive set theory. The goal here is to answer the question, what is a set in a way that is simple and intuitive, but technically not formal. Keep in mind that the goal here is to answer this question in a way that doesn't involve the ZFC axioms. So we want to avoid this nonsense. We're trying to hide from that. So then what is a set? Well, a set is a collection of objects called its elements or members. Now I want to clarify something about this statement. This statement is a description about what a set is. This is not the definition of a set. So if we wanted to define a set, we would have to introduce the ZFC axioms, and that's what we're trying to avoid here. So what do we mean by a description instead of a definition? What's the difference? Let's take a look at a different description of a set. A set is an object in mathematics that is studied. Now we can both agree that this is a statement and that this is not the definition of a set, but notice that I started the statement with a set is without actually defining a set. So this is a description, not the definition. Here's another example. A set is a collection. This is technically true, but this is not the definition of a set. So when I say that a set is a collection of objects called its elements or members, then I want you to consider what collections of objects might look like. And then, and then consider that a set is a collection of objects. That's a description again. Now this is where things get really weird and strange. Why is this not the definition of a set? I mean, you and I both know what a collection of objects is, right? Why can't we just call this the definition of a set? Well, if the statement is a description of a set and not a definition of a set, then that just means that some collections of objects are sets. Notice here the wording some. Keep in mind that when I say that a set is a collection of objects, that is a description and not a definition. So this begs the question, are all collections of objects also sets? This is where naive set theory gets really interesting. Now, before we answer this question, let's first cover some brief history of set theory, because the history of set theory is just as important as naive set theory itself. It turns out that understanding the history of set theory provides a means of interpreting the significance of naive set theory. It's really difficult to determine who first introduced the notion of sets. In early mathematics, the mission of a mathematician was to interpret complex mathematical objects using simpler mathematical objects. In math, sets, or at the time they were called manifolds, are the most basic building blocks. And it took a long time for mathematicians to come to this realization. And even saying that sets are the most basic building blocks is controversial. All of that said, Bernard Riemann was one of the first mathematicians to discover some basic building blocks to geometry. And he realized the importance of rigorously defining those basic building blocks so that the complex objects in mathematics could also be rigorously understood. To be specific, Riemann discovered that complex geometric objects could be built from what he called manifolds, which for the time being is just another word for sets. So for example, the earth is a sphere, but to us, the earth looks flat. Riemann studied how complex geometric objects are just simple objects oriented in unique ways. So for example, a sphere is made of a two-dimensional manifold, which itself can be constructed using the cross product of the real line. One of the greatest quotes from Riemann is this. It is well known that geometry presupposes not only the concept of space, 
but also the first fundamental notions for constructions in space, as given in advance. It only gives nominal definitions for them, while the essential means of determining them appear in the form of axioms. The relationship of these presumptions is left in the dark. One sees neither whether and in how far the connection is necessary, nor a priori whether it is possible. From Euclid de Legendre, to name the most renowned of modern writers of geometry, this darkness has been lifted neither by the mathematicians nor the philosophers who have labored upon it. So as you can see, this crisis in mathematics was an existential crisis for Riemann and many mathematicians. Riemann was never lucky enough to see the formalization of set theory, but his contributions were certainly crucial in the development of set theory. You can consider this time as the Big Bang of set theory. From here, mathematicians were set out to define a set rigorously. Richard Dedekind set out to rigorously define the real numbers by rigorously defining the irrational numbers using Dedekind cuts. This subtle formalization of the real number line is still used today in many real analysis textbooks. After this discovery, mathematicians realized that rigor wasn't involved in just complex objects, but that even the simple objects are complex to define. So in many ways, mathematics became a two-way street where you can discover more about complex objects or you can study the complexity behind the simplest objects. Either way, the mathematics behind both endeavors was and still is not simple to say the least. Now let's pause the set theory history for a moment and let me ask you a question. Once you have a collection can you identify a property where every element or member in that collection satisfies that property? So I have a property and I want to identify whether or not certain collections of sets meet that property, satisfy that property. Can we do this? Can we identify properties from collections of objects? Well, the answer is yes. We can identify properties from collections of objects. We do this all the time in mathematics. We might say that the natural numbers and the integers and the rational numbers are all countable sets. We might say that the real numbers and the complex numbers are both fields. We can say that the real number line has the least upper bound property. This is what it looks like to take a collection of objects and identify a property that all of its members collectively share. So after Dedekind discovered his cuts, the question about whether a set is a collection of objects by definition, was still unanswered. And so far, we have no reason to think that there are collections of objects that are not sets. So why is this not the definition of a set? Is every collection of objects also a set? Well, let's go back to the history of set theory to Gottlob Frege. The answer for him was yes, every collection of objects is a set. Frege was interested in constructing sets from other sets and from properties themselves. Let me ask you a question. Once you have a property, can you identify a collection of all sets that satisfy that property? To Frege, the answer was yes. He called this Basic Law 5, which is sometimes referred to as unrestricted comprehension. So instead of starting with a set and identifying properties that that set satisfies, we identify a property first, and this property gives rise to a collection of every set that satisfies that property. This is a collection of objects, but in many ways, this collection of objects should be forbidden, and we'll see why that is later on. So to clarify, the question is, can we start with a property and then define a collection of all sets where every set in this collection satisfies that property? Are these collections of objects also sets? To clarify about unrestricted comprehension, there is a notation that you might be familiar with if you've seen any small amount of set theory in the past. This is sort of like 
set builder notation, but there is a crucial difference between unrestricted comprehension and restricted comprehension. This notation allows us to construct sets by providing the representation of the objects within that set and a rule or a property that every object satisfies in the set. So for example, here I have a set where the representation of the objects looks like two by two matrices with a one in both the top left and bottom right entry and P for the top right and bottom left entry, where the property or the rule that these objects must satisfy is that P is prime. Now you might think you know what is in this set, but I wanna convince you that you don't know what's in this set because it's impossible to know everything that is in this set. What prime numbers are we talking about here? In different contexts, there are different notions for prime numbers. Is this really a two by two matrix or is it just a list of four numbers organized in a very convenient way that looks like a two by two matrix? The problem with unrestricted comprehension is that without context, we can become lost very easily. This caused problems that made many mathematicians very uncomfortable, including one of the most important set theorists in all of history, George Cantor. Cantor was interested in whether the set of everything should be a set. Now, I know a lot of math teachers like to immediately jump to Russell's paradox, but I think historically Cantor's theorem was not only first by 10 years, but also technically Russell's paradox is an immediate result from the proof of Cantor's theorem. And this is something that Russell admitted. Cantor's theorem states that the power set of any set is always strictly larger in cardinality, which means that the power set of any set will always have more elements than the original set. So let's obtain this result from a proof. We'll start with a function from any set A to its power set. Now recall that a power set is a set of all subsets of a set. If you want more information on that, I have a video that can help you better understand the power set. We're going to define this function naturally by mapping each element to the outputs that have the input as a singleton element in a set. And those are sets that certainly are in the power set. Now, as you can see from this specific example here, the power set clearly has more objects than just three objects. The power set here has eight objects when the original set has three objects. Clearly in this example, three is less than eight. So Cantor's theorem is true for this specific example. I wanna generalize this point to every possible set A, which is what Cantor did in his proof. So let's just assume that there is a function defined over a set A, such that this function is onto or surjective meaning that for every output, there is an input that maps to that output. So we're assuming that every possible output here is in fact an output. So let's pick a special output that is in the power set. This set B is clearly in the power set since it contains a collection of objects that are in A, whatever A is. All collections of objects from the set A must be in the power set of A. If F is surjective, then that means that there is an input Z that maps to this output B. So this means that F of Z is B. Now either Z is in B or it's not. If Z is in B, then that means that Z satisfies the rule of B, which means that Z is not in the output of Z. Since the output of Z is just B, this means that Z is not in B, which is a contradiction. Similarly, if Z is not in B, then that just means that Z does not satisfy the rule of B, which means that Z is in the output of the function F when the input is Z. Since the output of Z is B, this means that Z is in B, which is a contradiction. No matter which way we go, we run into a contradiction. And so the assumption that F is surjective must be false. This means that this injective function is not surjective, meaning that there are more outputs than there are inputs always. This means that the size of any set is always going to be less than the size of its power set, 
and that's a strict inequality. This means that the size of the natural numbers is strictly smaller than the size of the power set of the natural numbers. So if you thought the countable infinity from the natural numbers was a big infinity, it turns out that the power set is just so much bigger than that cardinality. This leads to some problems in set theory about infinity and defining sets rigorously, and these facts drove Cantor nuts. Now let's go back to the question, should the set of everything be a set? Well, according to Cantor, the answer was no, since if there was a set of everything, then the power set of the set of everything would be strictly larger than the set of everything. And that's very problematic, considering, considering the power set of the set of everything should be a subset of the set of everything, since the set of everything should contain everything. So this is a problem that needs to be solved. Apparently, we can't just take the collection of any objects and call that a set. So when do we run into trouble and how do we resolve these troubles? Shortly after George Cantor proved Cantor's theorem, Bertrand Russell discovered that it's problematic to have a collection of all sets with the property that A is not a member of itself. This discovery was the first time that mathematicians were convinced that you can't just unambiguously create a set from a property. Let's take a look as to why Russell's paradox is a paradox. Consider this set, which is defined as a collection of objects, such that A is a set and A is not a member of itself. So in this case, B is the collection of all objects that are sets that do not contain themselves. So to see the contradiction here, we have to ask the question, is the set B in B? Well, if B is in B, then that's because B satisfies the rule applied to B. And that rule is that B is not an element of itself, which is a direct contradiction. Similarly, if B is not a member of B, then that's because B does not satisfy the rule that B is not a member of itself. If you consider that double negative, that means that B is a member of itself since it is false that B is not a member of itself. That's a contradiction as well. So what assumption did we make in this paradox here? We came to a contradiction, but what assumption did we make? Usually when we run into contradictions, we find the assumption that we made that led to this contradiction in mathematics. The problem here is that we didn't really make an assumption other than Frege's basic law of five, which is just unrestricted comprehension. This means that unrestricted comprehension is a problematic approach to mathematics. At this point in history, Set theory was beginning to become understood by mathematicians, which solidified the foundations of mathematics. But this kind of sucks because we can't create sets from properties? This sounds like something that we would want to do very frequently, and it seems very inconvenient to not be able to identify a collection of all sets that satisfy a property. There is a way to fix this, though. Instead of making a set a collection of objects, we can distinguish between collections of objects that are sets and collections of objects that are not sets, but are unambiguously defined by a property. A class is a collection of sets that can be unambiguously defined by a property that all of its members share. Sometimes a class is a set, and sometimes it's not. So sure, we can't define sets that are collections of objects that are unambiguously defined from properties, but we can define these special abstract mathematical objects as classes instead. Now, classes that are not sets are called proper classes, and these are strange objects to talk about, and they are the objects that naive set theory completely avoids altogether. The goal here is to make set theory accessible for everyone, and proper classes can really mess things up. In many ways, George Cantor is considered to be the founder of set theory, and that's because his skepticism and contributions to naive set theory are still heavily used, even more so than the ZFC axioms, because naive set theory is simple and elegant. On top of that, Cantor was very concerned about basic law five, and technically he never submitted himself to that law. 
when at the time it was very tempting to follow Frege's unrestricted comprehension. Instead, Cantor defines sets as a collection of well-defined objects called its elements or members. This definition is flawless in the sense that it is true and correct. That said, this definition is very inconvenient because it begs the question, what is a well-defined object? But we all know what we mean here, right? <laughs> we could just leave the hard work for the set theorists that are actually serious enough to understand what a well-defined object is. Instead, we can have this notion of a set so that we can have a notion of collections of objects that don't mess up mathematics altogether. This is naive set theory. So let's talk about set builder notation and how it differs from unrestricted comprehension. You see, set builder notation requires a domain, which brings context to the notation. So earlier we saw that unrestricted comprehension can lead to problems because of ambiguity. Set builder notation provides context, and so there's no room for ambiguity. Now you might ask, what are the natural numbers? And this is a question for set theorists to determine with the ZFC axioms, not the naive set theorists like us. Let's try to visualize set builder notation because when I was first introduced to set builder notation, I was really confused as to why each component to this notation is necessary, absolutely necessary. So we start with a collection of well-defined sets. These are given to us by those super smart mathematicians that have already figured out what a collection of well-defined sets are. We will actually end up defining sets properly and formally using ZFC axioms in a future video. So now that we have the context, which we can sometimes call the universe, and no, I don't mean the universe that you live in, I mean the universe of well-defined sets, which again is something that is rigorously and formally defined with ZFC axioms. So now that we have our universe, we can identify a property and gather all the objects which are sets in that universe that satisfy that property. This set is a set that is constructed from its representation, its domain, and the rule that each of its sets satisfy. This is set builder notation, and this is exactly how we create or construct sets from previously constructed sets, which then is a well-defined object in and of itself because it comes from well-defined objects by definition. This is set builder notation, and this is a definition. So here we have a representation of what the object might look like, here we have a domain and the universe, and we have a rule that each object must satisfy. But then all of this just begs the question, what is a set? <laughs> Did we seriously just come all this way to find out that we never really define what a set is in naive set theory? Is this really what you came for? Well, sort of, yeah. This is one of the first times in mathematics where mathematicians submitted to the reader that they should do the important work as an exercise if you want to. But it's not necessary because you know what it is, right? You know what a set is, kind of, right? So to Cantor, he didn't really care about what a set was specifically and formally. He just wanted to have a tool to use sets and set notation in mathematics. And that's what we're here for. That's what naive set theory is for. So yes, this was letter So yes, this was literally an exercise that Cantor left for mathematicians. But think about what we're doing here with this question. We're taking this question and not answering it. We're kind of leading ourselves back to this question, but during the process of not answering this question, we get a self-referential tool that makes us feel good on the inside. That's naive set theory. Now I could go on to talk about the ZFC axioms or even classes or the Morse Kelly set theory or first order logic, but instead I'm gonna leave this exercise for the reader and for myself because 
I want to eventually cover the ZFC axioms anyways in this channel, and I'm excited to do that soon. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you all next time.